Good afternoon, I'm Elaine Whalen, Program Director at the Anticoagulation Forum. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Vascular Protection, Preventing Thrombotic Complications of VTE and PAD. The AC Forum and the American Heart Association have partnered to share resources in these important areas and we're proud collaborators on the PAD Awareness and World Thrombosis Day campaigns. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Jeff Barnes and Dr. Scott Damrauer with us today to discuss these important topics in a case-based format. Dr. Barnes is a cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist at the University of Michigan Health System. He is currently co-director of the Michigan Anticoagulation Quality Improvement Initiative, or MACI. Dr. Damrauer is a vascular surgeon and an assistant professor of surgery at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. We also have with us today some AC Forum board members, Dr. Tracy Minicciello. She is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and chief of anticoagulation and thrombosis services at the San Francisco VA Hospital. Dr. Minicciello serves as subject matter expert for the VA, creating guidelines, protocols, and teaching materials related to anticoagulation and thrombosis. Dr. Sarah. Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah Vasquez is clinical pharmacist specializing in thrombosis management at the University of Utah Health Thrombosis Service in Salt Lake City. Her clinical interest includes direct oral anticoagulants, drug interaction, and post-thrombotic syndrome. Diane Worth is an adult nurse practitioner with a background in administration and anticoagulation management. She is the manager of the heart failure program at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Thank you all for volunteering your time to teach our members. As always, you can ask questions from the audience using the chat box. Uh, and we want to thank Dr. Barnes again for being able to be here. Dr. Barnes is going to kick us off with this case-based program. OK, I'm just pulling up my screen here. And it looks like everyone can see this now, which is wonderful. So uh, just a quick set of disclosures for myself and Dr. Damrauer, uh, because we are talking about anticoagulation, I wanna make sure everyone knows about these and that for Dr. Damrauer, that uh, he does work for the VA, but that his uh, views are his own and don't ne necessarily represent the government. So we're gonna present two cases and really try and have a discussion around those cases today. I'm gonna present this first one, and this is a, a case of uh, venous thromboembolism. This is a case of a 32-year-old woman. She's presented to clinic after having a recent DVT be diagnosed. She developed a DVT in her right leg after a four-hour car ride. Uh, she presented into the emergency department. They diagnosed her with a DVT on an ultrasound study, and they chose to treat her with rivaroxaban. Now, when they reviewed her past medical history, they found out that she had a DVT about three years ago when she was taking some oral contraceptive pills. So in addition to stopping the oral contraceptive pills, they gave her six months of warfarin at that time. In review of her social history, she's a non-smoker, she's recently been married, and she's had no children or prior pregnancies. So as I reflected on this case, and as I think about what's happening when she presents to clinic, a couple questions really come up to me, and I think we're, we're gonna go through each of these. Uh, the first is, why did she develop DVT? And is there anything that maybe really kicked this off? The second is, is rivaroxaban an appropriate therapy choice for her, given some of the different uh, features in her case? Third is, how long should we think about treating her? And then, of course, this is a young woman recently married who may have interest in getting pregnant. How might her recent DVT and the choice of anticoagulants impact her desire to get pregnant over the next one to two years? And, and how would we want to counsel her? So these are some of the questions that I've been reflecting on. So why don't we jump into these and have a little bit of group discussion? So the first question is, why did she develop the DVT? And many people will look at common provoking factors, things like recent surgery or car travel, but it's also pretty common that I hear people ask about thrombophilia testing and should they be ordering thrombophilia testing when patients have uh, DVT or PE? And I think one of the key messages that I try and uh, share with clinicians and even with patients is that we really only want to do thrombophilia testing if it's gonna impact clinical care for our patient. Uh, some examples of how it might impact care would be whether or not it's going to change the choice of anticoagulant that we're using for a patient, if it has any impact on how long we might choose to treat patients, whether or not it would mean we would choose to screen family members, 
And of course, if it has implications for other aspects of care, such as for patients who want to get pregnant and whether they would then need some sort of prophylaxis around the time of their pregnancy. So those would be some of the reasons that you may say, yes, thrombophilia testing is important to do. So for this patient, we were able to order a whole bunch of uh, thrombophilia tests, and we actually have them uh, grouped as a panel. And uh, most of them came back normal, but she did come back as heterozygous for factor V light. And this is pretty common. I think we see this sort of all the time. So what does that actually mean uh, for her, and how much do we think this really influenced both her initial blood clot that happened about three years ago and the blood clot that's happened here more recently? So a quick summary about factor V Leiden and its association with VTE, we tend to not order it in the general population. It, it's much more common that this is ordered for patients who um, have already had a VTE. Yet we often don't think about the fact that factor V Leiden has different effects for people having their first VTE and people having recurrent VTE. So if you look in this table here, you'll see across the top line for heterozygous factor V Leiden, which is the most common form, the odds ratio of developing an initial VTE is about four, but the odds ratio for recurrent VTE is a little bit lower. And so what that means to me is it may not have as much of an impact in whether or not I uh, choose long-term or short-term anticoagulation in patients who've already had their first clot. And so this is an, an important distinction that sometimes I have to uh, explain to my colleagues. Now, homozygous factor V Leiden, which is far more rare, does raise uh, the risk of both initial and recurrent VTE uh, more significantly. And so that uh, can sometimes play in. It's also important to remember that about 5% of the general population has factor V Leiden. So that's about one in 20 patients sort of just walking down the street. And amongst patients who have a blood clot, it's been estimated that somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15% of patients will have a factor V Leiden mutation. It's more common in Caucasian patients uh, than in the non-Caucasian, and that the homozygous mutation is, is really quite rare. Most of the time, it's a uh, heterozygous mutation. Uh, so I find that for me, many patients are asking about thrombophilia testing or they already have thrombophilia testing when they come to clinic, and yet the most common results, which would be something like a factor V Leiden mutation uh, that's heterozygous, tends to not really impact my clinical decision-making a whole lot, uh, and so it's something that I don't necessarily uh, order routinely for a lot of patients. I don't know if anyone on the panel has other thoughts about this and sort of how they think about the thrombophilia testing for patients who've had recurrent VTE, uh, and in particular, what happens when you get these factor V Leiden mutations uh, that pop up? Any thoughts from any of the other panelists? So, I, Jeff, this is Tracy. I would completely agree with your approach, and I think that um, we're really trying to get people to be very thoughtful about the use of thrombophilia testing and only use it if it's going to influence therapy. Um, I tend to I'm interested in ordering it in the people who I think there's a chance of finding and in whom it will change what we do, and that tends to be younger patients who have recurrent thrombosis or clot in a strange place um, or clot through anticoagulants. So I think that those are the folks that we tend to um, think about doing it in. And I will say that factor V Leiden obviously is a very common thing to find, and as I usually say to the, the house staff, it's a relatively wimpy risk factor for clotting and not one that really piques our interest so much, particularly in the heterozygous form, and really doesn't inform what you do in a person who has it and hasn't clotted or who has it and has clotted. Because the baseline risk for thrombosis in this population, especially this age, is so low that even if your odds ratio is 4.2 of having your first clot, it's still so low that we don't actually do anything. So I completely agree with you. I think being very, very mindful about it because um, people then feel like they are carrying around this mutation. They're not really sure what to do with it. I would say that one population we do sometimes explore thrombophilia testing with a lower threshold are patients who are uh, women of childbearing years because mm -hmm. sometimes it's influence on how we manage pregnancy and how we kind of counsel, although there is admittedly some debate about even the validity of that. Yeah, no, I think those are excellent points. The other thing I often will uh, tell patients and, and, and other uh, providers is that um, the, the risk factors that tend to be higher in the thrombophilia panel are the ones that are much less common. So if it's going to really change clinical practice, it's less likely to be found, especially in somebody who's only had their first VTE event. So I would agree with you. I, I don't order it for uh, the majority of patients. I also um, 
struggle because when a, you have a negative or a normal thrombophilia panel, it doesn't mean there wasn't something that led to you having a clot. It just means we don't know how to test for it and how to look for it. And so that can be also something I don't want to provide patients false reassurance that just because they had a negative thrombophilia panel, that means they can get a short course of anticoagulation and not have to worry about things. The other clinical factors are really important when we think about how long to anticoagulate somebody and uh, what their risk of a subsequent clot is. And if we can right now, just there is a, a question from the audience, which I think many people are probably harboring, um, which is about in light of the issue of the DOACs and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and that we don't do that, who would you check for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome right out of the gate? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I know um, you're probably going to talk about antiphospholipid syndrome at a, an upcoming uh, webinar, so you'll be able to really get into the meat of it. Um, I think about testing for it in, uh, in patients exactly like you described, patients who are younger. So my patients who are under 50 to 60 who have their first clot, uh, patients who have clot in unusual uh, locations. So if you have a portal vein clot or, or something else, a cerebral uh, vein clot, something like that, not sort of the routine run-of-the-mill DVT or PE. Um, and I am now getting more comfortable using the direct oral anticoagulants in the antiphospholipid antibody patients, but I make sure that I have a really frank conversation with patients that we don't have as much evidence uh, in that population. And certainly if they're the, quote, triple positive uh, antiphospholipid patient, then I would avoid it. So I do find that it helps me with some of the decision making uh, in those cases. But, you know, when you've got your 70 year old patient or your patient who recently had a surgery who now developed a clot, I'm not routinely testing uh, for uh, antiphospholipid syndrome in those patients just because the likelihood of it being uh, positive is so low. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I wanted to just um, also loop in Diane and Sarah and see if they have any thoughts about that. But I, I don't test for APLS to see if someone can take a DOAC. I think that was one of the questions. I think that's what people are wondering. Do you test because what if, you know, to make sure that they're okay for a DOAC? I don't unless it's someone who I really have a very high pretest probability for having APLS. So Diane and Sarah, any, any thoughts about that? Um, this is Diane, and I think I'm selective, especially in the female population. If they've had recurrent fetal loss, I will test them for APLS, um, and I will not use a DOAC if they're positive for sure. Um, and if they're someone that's trying to get pregnant again, I'll just use low molecular weight heparin with them uh, while they're trying to conceive and have been successful that way with them carrying pregnancies through them. So this is probably actually a really good transition to the next slide. And one of the questions that uh, I posed when we first reviewed this case is, is rivaroxaban an appropriate drug for this patient? Uh, and there's lots of different ways that you can look at it. Is it an appropriate drug for somebody who's had recurrent VTE? Is it an appropriate drug for somebody based on the findings of her thrombophilia panel? Uh, I think these are all sort of really relevant uh, questions to ask. Um, and I think my take on it is that rivaroxaban probably is an okay drug for her to use. It's certainly easy because it's an all oral strategy. Uh, the same can be said of a pixaban. It's an all oral strategy. You don't don't need that five to 10 days of lead in with some form of a heparin. You can just start with the higher dose uh, for the first week or, or three weeks in the case of rivaroxaban. Um, but specific to this patient who's now had recurrent VTE, uh, what evidence do we have to tell us that it's really safe to use? Um, and so the first thing is, Often I'll use rivaroxaban because I can treat for the first three to six months. And then in patients in whom I want to give longer courses, it's really easy to decrease the dose. So you can go from 20 milligrams a day of rivaroxaban down to 10 milligrams a day and give them that extended course. The same can be done with a pixaban. They can go from five milligrams twice a day down to two and a half milligrams twice a day in that extended phase. So it's a, it's a really nice, easy transition, which is why I often will start with either of those two drugs. And this is some of the data showing how the lower dose of rivaroxaban in this case was uh, more efficacious even than aspirin uh, with similar bleeding event in that sort of long-term phase. But of course, in this patient, we also have to think about factor V Leiden. And do we feel comfortable using the direct oral anticoagulants in patients who had various thrombophilias? And there have been a couple different studies that have looked at this. This is one where they took 
uh, three different randomized trials of dabigatran patients, so one of the other direct oral anticoagulants, and they looked at what happened in their patients with thrombophilia. Now, they had a range of different thrombophilias, but as you would expect, Factor V Leiden was the most common. And what you can see here is that the efficacy of dabigatran was similar to the efficacy of warfarin. And I think we've clinically seen that with all of the direct oral anticoagulants. So for patients who have the more routine forms of thrombophilia, like Factor V Leiden, I feel very comfortable personally using uh, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, uh, dabigatran in those patients. I think the question comes up a little more around antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and certainly that's a sort of a bit of a moving target here over the last year as we've gotten some new data. Um, I'll ask the rest of the panel, do you feel comfortable in general using uh, the direct oral anticoagulants in the majority of your uh, quote-unquote thrombophilia patients? Uh, any specific groups that maybe you would avoid or, or ways you think about it? I don't know, Sarah, do you maybe have any thoughts on that? This is Diane, Jeff. I don't have any qualms about using the DOAX and, and uh, the general population with thrombophilias with the exception of antiphospholipid. And I would agree with that as well. Yep, I would agree with that too. Yeah, and so I think that's really, you know, where we're at. For, for the majority of patients, again, it's not changing. The thrombophilia panel is not necessarily changing our drug choice uh, so much anymore as we've really gained some pretty good clinical experience. So then the last, uh, one of the last questions that came up was, well, how long should this patient be treated? And this is something I often struggle with. We know that patients who have a clearly provoked VTE event, you can give them a short course of anticoagulation, maybe three or six months as, as she did when she had her first clot three years ago. And then we think that their risk of recurrence is reasonably low, that you can stop. But what do you do when they've had recurrent VTE? We often talk about continuing anticoagulation indefinitely, but sometimes I struggle when when these patients come in with a second provoked clot and sort of what does that mean? You know, this is an interesting study published just a couple years ago. These are patients, all of whom had recurrent VTE. And what you can see on the left side of the screen is that in patients with recurrent VTE, if they only got a limited course of anticoagulation, that's the solid black bar, their risk of recurrence over the next 10 years rose uh, pretty steadily. But those uh, who got continued indefinite anticoagulation in the dotted bar, their risk of recurrence was much lower. So when you're on treatment, you're less likely to get a clot. Now, what if there's a difference? You know, when that second clot was provoked versus unprovoked, does that really have much of a difference? And that's what the right side of the screen helps us see. And what they're showing here is that statistically in this group, there was no difference in recurrence rate, whether that second clot was provoked or unprovoked. And so I tend to tell most of my patients that if you've had two provoked clots, we should be thinking pretty seriously about longer courses of anticoagulation. I don't mandate it, and uh, sometimes I'll be selective, but I tell them that if you've formed clot more than once, we may want to think about a long course of an anticoagulant, and often it's a good uh, situation to use one of those low doses, either the 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban or the 2.5 milligrams uh, of apixaban. Any other comments on that from, from the group? How do you guys think about sort of this recurrent provoked VTE and does it, does it play into your decision making? Um, so interesting case. So what, what I would say, particularly in this case, I don't find four hours in a car a very strong provoking factor. So I, I would think about her actually as a single provoked thrombosis related to OCP. And we know those patients generally have a very low risk of recurrence, although not the case here. Um, but that the second event, I think, really shows us that this woman has an underlying hypercoagulable state, whether we, and I don't think factor V Leiden is the end of the story there. Um, but I would kind of think of her more as a second, an unprovoked thrombosis, and, and my recommendations for anticoagulation would really be kind of on that. I think it, I also would say that I don't feel that all provoked thromboses are created equally. There is the provocation related to a major surgery or a major trauma. And I think if you had clots after two major surgeries, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you stay on forever. But I think a clot that was seriously provoked in the past and now you have kind of a minor risk factor is showing you that this patient as the decades go on likely is gonna have a higher risk of thrombosis. So then I'm much more interested in secondary prevention. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm really glad you brought up the point about the car ride because I see this all the time. People will say, well, I just drove, you know, three or four or five hours. Um, and to me, that's usually not a provoking risk factor. If you've flown across an ocean, if you've truly gotten an eight hour car ride where you maybe only got up once, you know, okay, then I'm, then I'm thinking about that. But, you know, these more typical sort of shorter car rides, we see this all the time. I live in Michigan. People will say, I just drove in from Chicago. It was a four hour car ride. I agree with you. To me, that's not really uh, much of a provoking factor. And so it raises my suspicion about the underlying uh, hypercoagulable state. So I'm going to move on to the last question here, which was, uh, this is a young woman. She told me in clinic that, you know, well, what will this mean about pregnancy and how do we sort of need to think about that? Um, this was a nice meta-analysis looking at patients who had factor V Leiden and what their risk of having recurrent fetal loss either earlier or later in the course. And what you see here from this study, and granted it's a somewhat uh, biased selected study, is that there may be a little bit of an increased uh, risk. And so um, when you look at some of the guidelines that are out there, including the OBGYN guidelines, they actually have a recommendation that say that factor V Leiden patients who've previously had a venous thromboembolism event will often anticoagulate them antepartum and postpartum. Now that's a little bit, uh, that's a little different from the patient who has factor V Leiden but has never had a VTE event before. Those patients usually we would not anticoagulate unless there's some other factor that really pushes them over the edge, such as they just had a, a cesarean delivery, so maybe a little bit of a bigger risk or a very strong family history, uh, something else. Um, clinically, I actually think that there are a lot of factor V Leiden patients and I don't see them receiving anticoagulation routinely, so I'm not sure how, um, how routinely this is getting into practice. And I don't know from the panel if you guys have uh, had a different experience, but we tend to reserve um, treatment uh, of uh, patients in the peripartum period really specifically to those who've previously had a VTE event or have one of the highest risk um, uh, uh, thrombophilias. Um, so I, I would agree with that. In this case, you have a patient who had a hormone-associated thrombosis. So putting the factor V line aside, she had OCPs and had a clot, and that would lead to a recommendation for protecting her during her pregnancy and after in a shared decision-making way. Um, the factor V line, and you're right, if in a patient who doesn't have a history of thrombosis, if they don't have a strong family history of thrombosis or other risk factors, uh, they wouldn't necessarily be um, offered or it, it, they may not be recommended to have anything other than clinical surveillance. If they do have risk factors and they haven't had a clot, then often postpartum prophylaxis is recommended. And, and much of this is outlined in the chest, chest guidance and ACOG has an approach to it too. And if you look at these two, you'll see they're not totally in line. And I think that's because there is a paucity of, of literature around this, this area. I also think that uh, one of the points in this case and on this slide matches with something that we highlighted before, where we may see increased risk, an odd ratio of two or an odd ratio of four, but you have to understand that that's an odds ratio compared to a baseline risk, and that the average woman who's having a pregnancy is not at an extremely high risk of developing VTE. And so even when there's an odds ratio of two, you're going from a very small risk to only a slightly smaller risk. So I would agree, for my patients who've previously had VTE events, those are the ones in whom I'm going to treat. But, you know, if they had factor V Leiden that was found by some other testing, but they've never personally had a history, most of the time I'm not going to recommend uh, anticoagulation for them because their risk is still relatively low, even if it is slightly higher. So Jeff, let me play devil's advocate. So she doesn't want to get pregnant, this girl, so we're not going to take that into effect. How long would you treat her, presuming this is an unprovoked clot, and would you choose an extended treatment dose and at what point? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So I would definitely give her full dose anticoagulation for at least three months. And then at that point, I would have a conversation with her and, and I would probably go through some of this data and say, look, you've now shown that you can develop clots um, you know, multiple times. And as we just mentioned, you can develop a clot without a very strong provoking factor, just, you know, the short car ride, if that was even a, a piece of it. And so I would think about wanting to be on some sort of protection longer term for her. And I would uh, sort of outline what that is, full dose anticoagulation, low dose anticoagulation, or antiplatelet therapy, and sort of talk with her about the risks and benefits of each of those. I find most of my patients would choose to take the low dose anticoagulation approach. So for her, that would 
mean going from 20 of rivaroxaban down to 10 of rivaroxaban. It's once a day. It's fairly effective. It does not have a significant bleeding risk. And I would probably do that, you know, longer term. But I would make sure that she knows that any time she's starting to think about getting pregnant, she needs to be back in contact with me because we need to stop rivaroxaban. That would not be a good med for her to be on if she got pregnant. We would want to transition her over uh, to something else such as low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Thank you. And so let, carrying on with the same patient, um, let's assume that she didn't have that previous um, OCP provoked and she had a single unprovoked event and factor five light. And is this someone that you would bridge periprocedurally? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And I think that um, I would not bridge her as long as she's taking rivaroxaban because there's no role of, in bridging because the direct oral anticoagulants have such a short half-life that we don't need to worry about the, the bridging piece. Now, if for uh, any number of reasons she chose to be taking warfarin, then I would say, okay, now we have to ask about that bridging question. And to me, the, the question of whether or not to bridge would probably come into how soon she were having a procedure. If she's requiring a procedure within one year of having her VTE event, then I will often err on the side of going ahead and bridging those patients. But if they've gotten a year or more out from their last VTE event, I will usually say we don't need to bridge because I don't think the recurrence risk of VTE uh, uh, before the surgery is um, very high. After the surgery, I would absolutely choose to bridge her because anyone who's had clot in the past, having a, a surgical event could set them up to have another clot. So I would want her to get post-operative uh, uh, VTE prophylaxis in, in as uh, quick a manner or as is safe from the surgical standpoint. Okay. And if, Jeff, if I can just make a comment. I, I think just to highlight that the decision whether to bridge or not to bridge is really based on the on, on when this, this interruption is in relation to the clot, not about the factor V Leiden. The heterozygous factor V Leiden isn't really playing a, a role here. It's really how the close proximity and that. And then also if it's getting towards the end of the year, I think many people would opt for a prophylactic dose of anticoagulation rather than full intensity because you're really out of full intensity treatment by that point in a garden variety thrombosis. So, so there are choices, um, even if you chose to bridge, about what dose of anticoagulant you might use or low molecular heparin you might use. I, I think that's an excellent point. I really think of those first three months as being the highest risk period, and I'm going to try and not have a procedure if possible. But if we need a procedure, they absolutely will either get bridging if they're a warfarin patient or will, you know, continue them on their, their rivaroxaban or their direct oral anticoagulant. Between three and 12 months, they're sort of in that middle ground where we might go either way and we can think about personalizing the decision making. And then after 12 months is where bridging, at least pre-procedurally, becomes less important to me. Obviously, anyone should get good VTE prophylaxis post-operatively because we wouldn't want the operation to be associated with another clot. So we should... Uh... Yeah, so I'll just wrap up the case. You know, this is a patient who uh, chose to continue on rivaroxaban after we talked about everything. And, and as I mentioned, we really stressed to her the importance of contacting us as soon as she thought about getting pregnant because we wouldn't want her to take a direct oral anticoagulant if she was planning to get pregnant. We would want to switch her to a medicine uh, that we know a little bit more about its safety profile uh, for uh, pregnant patients. So I'll go ahead and stop, uh, stop sharing and turn it over to Scott. Great, Jeff. Thanks. I think that was a really wonderful treatment of kind of the, the issues relating to anticoagulation and antithrombotic therapy for DVT. And we're now really going to switch to something very, very different, both with respect to uh, the medications we're talking about, as well as kind of very much the patients um, themselves. So you know, when we consider PAD, I think there's a lot of salient issues to, to talk about. Really, looking both at the anticoagulants, but also just as importantly about the antiplatelet options. And then finally, how the two of those really interact with each other and can be thought of as either synergistic or uh, you know, dually problematic when we think about adverse events. And so you know, framing this in the setting of a case, this is a 74-year-old gentleman who came to clinic with an arterial ulceration on his right foot. He had uh, had this for a long, you know, recently, it was fully worked up and very clear that this was due to a long segment uh, superficial femoral artery occlusion. 
um, you know, when we look at this patient, he had many of the same past medical history as, as all of our vascular patients do. He had high blood pressure. He'd had a heart attack in the past and actually had a coronary bypass. He was a diabetic and he had some minor, mild renal insufficiency. Um, he had been on aspirin for quite some time, rosuvastatin, uh, which is a statin to treat his lipids, metformin, as well as lisinopril. And so really before we even get into thinking about uh, how this current event changes, I think it's worthwhile considering what we should be thinking about with respect to the patient with peripheral artery disease and preventing thrombotic complications. And I, I think that there's a lot of conflating of the goals of this that goes on both in um, providers' minds and in patients' minds about why they're on certain medication. And I think it's important to disentangle them really to understand what the different therapies uh, are being used to achieve. And so really when we think about this with a patient with PAD, and the vast majority of these patients have documented uh, CAD with a significant portion that don't have documented CAD actually having undocumented coronary artery disease, we really have to consider what I think what is two broad categories of disease. So we have uh, two goals of, of our intervention. So one is to prevent uh, major averse cardiovascular events or MACE. So here we're really talking about doing things to prevent myocardial infarction or heart attack stroke or cardiovascular death. And then the second, really to prevent major averse limb events. So separate from heart attack, stroke, and death, the idea that can we prevent either the need for revascularization, so the need for a peripheral vascular intervention in the uh, cath lab or an open operation, and even more importantly, can we prevent the need for an amputation? And so we have a whole host of agents at our disposal to do this, including uh, aspirin monotherapy, P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy, so uh, clopidogrel or ticagrelor, dual antiplatelet therapy, and then finally antithrombotic therapy. So really, uh, historically, aspirin monotherapy has been the mainstay of this, and there's very good evidence that this prevents secondary events uh, with respect to the cardiovascular disease. You know, there's less good data this really offers much with respect to limb events. Um, moving kind of at least as I think of it in terms of up in strength from there, we have the P2Y12 inhibitors and either by themselves or in combination with aspirin. And there's have been a large number of studies looking at different combinations of either CAD status or PAD status or both of them together. And I think the sum of that data suggests that there probably is a role for further reducing uh, MACE and potentially for reducing male but at the cost of increased risk of bleeding. And then finally, antithrombotic therapy. You know, this is an area where historically our main drug here was warfarin, and it was pretty clear that the data didn't support using warfarin in either of these two scenarios uh, to try to prevent adverse outcomes. However, there's recently been a lot of enthusiasm about the potential to use rivaroxaban at a low dose for this. The COMPASS trial, which was reported just over a year ago, looked at giving patients low-dose rivaroxaban with aspirin versus aspirin alone versus rivaroxaban alone, and really had some positive findings suggesting the combination of low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin uh, prevented both uh, mace and male in, uh, in patients with PAD and CAD. And in fact, uh, we just saw about 30 minutes before the webinar that the FDA approved the use of low-dose rivaroxaban for the prevention of major adverse cardiac events, which was the primary endpoint in that trial, for uh, patients with PAD and CID. So I think it'd be very interesting to see how that plays out and, you know, the, a topic really that probably should be explored fully at, at a later point. Um, you know, I'm curious from the other panelists, what do people see in their practices uh, in terms of different patterns for prevention of secondary events? This is Diane. We're real excited about uh, being able to use this, especially in our PAD with the CAD and see if it does uh, decrease the amount of hospitalizations we have with those patients. They're high utilizers um, with their uh, vascular disease. And so um, it will be exciting. And our vascular surgeons are very excited about having an agent that will um, hopefully decrease some of the um, 
the procedures that they're going to have to do, even though that's not what's coming out on the PI. Um, I think if we use it in the appropriate populations, we may get that outcome as well. And I, I would echo um, Diane's comments that there is a lot of excitement about this. As, as we all know, there's not a lot you can offer for, for um, changing outcome in this population. Um, so I think people are also excited to see if uh, the data supports the use shortly after interventions as well, which I understand we're not, that's not part of the COMPASS trial, but I think there is definitely a lot of Yeah, Scott, for, for me, I see a lot of either aspirin monotherapy or P2I12 monotherapy in our routine PAD patients. And then amongst those who have had some sort of an intervention, that's when they tend to combine the two or bring on some sort of an anticoagulant. So that tends to be a lot of the practice I'm seeing. Yeah, and that's very similar to what our practice is, Jeff. And I, certainly, you know, Diane and Tracy, I completely agree with you. I think the COMPASS trial was uh, very exciting to see reported. And the change in the FD indication in Rivaroxaban, I think, is one of the uh, really only things that has come around in this patient population recently that may have an opportunity to prevent uh, limb outcomes. And it'll be very interesting to see whether the real world experience with that mirrors what we're seeing in the trial and how people start using that and what the right patient population is. Um, continuing on with this patient, uh, he ultimately underwent a right common femoral artery to below the knee popliteal artery bypass using PTFE graft. And so PTFE is basically a rolled up tube of Gore-Tex. Um, it is one of the two main conduits we use for doing lower extremity bypass the other being uh, autogenous saphenous veins. So when people have good saphenous veins that we can uh, harvest and transpose into the arterial position, we really prefer that because it has a much extended durability. Um, so really, anytime we use a prosthetic conduit, it comes to the fore of what else can we do uh, postoperatively to improve the durability of our intervention and hopefully decrease the, the need for either further interventions or amputation. And so, you know, going back to, again, what are indications for antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy are in this population, I think now following intervention, we have this additional goal that we're trying to achieve, which is also to improve the durability of our intervention. And I completely agree with you, Tracy. It's going to be very interesting to see whether or not uh, people kind of extrapolate from the COMPASS trial and think about using rivaroxaban in this setting and what that experience and data shows. I mean, it's clearly not what was done in that trial, but I think uh, you know, that's been on a lot of people's minds. What we do know from the data uh, largely comes from the CASPER trial, which was a randomized study of patients undergoing lower extremity bypass to below the knee target. And they were randomized either to aspirin plus clopidogrel or aspirin plus placebo. And this trial, first of all, illustrates a number of things that we have known about lower extremity bypasses. So we know that there is a non-insignificant rate of adverse outcomes. And here that was defined as the graft stopping to work, the need for additional interventions, the need for an amputation or death. Um, we also know, as you can see here, the two dark lines have less events than the two dashed lines. The two dark lines are the vein conduits. And we know that vein conduits perform better than prosthetic conduits. What I think this graph shows us nicely is that in patients who receive both clopidogrel and aspirin, the performance of their prosthetic conduits was much closer to that of the vein conduits than people who just received aspirin. And so for these reasons, um, at least in my practice, and most people tend to think about putting people who had prosthetic lower extremity bypass system below the knee on clopidogrel uh, in addition to their aspirin. So this patient was started on 75 milligrams of clopidogrel and then did really well for about four years until some slow flow was noted in the graft and a number of other lesions were noted in their low extremity arterial system such that they needed a repeat intervention. And so the patient went down and had a common uh, iliac artery stent and a below the knee popliteal artery balloon angioplasty with a drug coated balloon. And the significance here is that these interventions really, uh, especially the drug-coated balloon angioplasty, move you to the setting where the patient has a, a pretty strong indication for dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for at least three months. And then I think there's a lot of debate about how long after that. 
Unfortunately, to further complicate this scenario, the patient developed postoperative atrial fibrillation. So now this gets us into the therapy of this gentleman has a pretty strong indication for having dual antiplatelet therapy and has a pretty reasonable indication for antithrombotic therapy. How do we manage these together? And what do we do to minimize the risk of thrombotic complications while at the same time, you know, decreasing or minimizing any bleeding risk? And so first off, you know, should he be anticoagulated for his atrial fibrillation? And then if so, how do we combine that with his antiplatelet regimen? So in the setting of atrial fibrillation, I think is not novel to this audience is the idea that we really assess the risk of thrombosis. And so we can use the chad vast score, which assigns points for different categories of risk to give you a total score, and then it translates that into a uh, percent per year absolute risk of stroke. So in this gentleman, um, the hypertension gets him one point, his age greater than or equal to 75 gets him two, he's diabetic and he has vascular disease, so he has a total of five, which is a rather significant chad vast score and translates into a 7% per year risk of stroke. This is certainly in the range that we would recommend anticoagulation. As I said, this becomes a bit challenging to think about when he's already going to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. And there have been a number of both observational studies as well as a number of randomized uh, controlled trials trying to answer this question of what the right combination of these medications is. Um, this is not the primary data, but this is a presentation of it that I found to be rather helpful that the paper that's currently in press at coronary artery disease um, in which they combined the data from those 12 observational studies and four randomized controlled trials and a meta-analysis. And they really broke this down into two groups. People, uh, people who were on anticoagulation, which could be either uh, uh, a vitamin K antagonist or a direct oral anticoagulant plus dual antiplatelet therapy, which is aspirin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor, or anticoagulation plus a single antiplatelet therapy. And they really didn't ask what the anticoagulant was or what the dose of that anticoagulant was. The vast majority of these patients were patients who had atrial fibrillation, providing them the need for anticoagulation, and then who subsequently underwent percutaneous coronary intervention or had a heart attack such that they had an indication for antiplatelet therapy. What they saw was a significant increased risk of bleeding events in people on dual antiplatelet and anticoagulation. So the way this graph is set up is that the uh, reference category or the comparison is to dual antiplatelet therapy. So the fact that you see the major bleeding is in red and to the left shows that being on monotherapy or only being on a single antiplatelet agent significantly reduces your risk of major bleeding as compared to being on two uh, antiplatelet agents in the same of anticoagulation. There was a similar trend, but not significant result for minor bleeding. And then the thrombotic endpoints to the trial, myocar recurrent myocardial infarction, stroke, stent thrombosis, or repeat vas revascularization, had a slight trend towards uh, increased rates in monotherapy and decreased rates in uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, but none of these reached statistical significance. And so the way most people have interpreted this data is that uh, being on monotherapy instead of being on dual antiplatelet therapy when you have to be on anticoagulation definitely decreases your bleeding risk and probably doesn't fundamentally change your risk of clotting or decrease or, or hamper your ability to prevent the uh, averse endpoints you're concerned about. Another study that looked at this, and this was actually part of the previous meta-analysis, focused explicitly on rivaroxaban, again, in people who had atrial fibrillation and underwent percutaneous coronary intervention, and they uh, compared three pretty interesting groups. Um, the first group was rivaroxaban uh, plus a P2Y12 inhibitor. The second group was low-dose rivaroxaban plus dual antiplatelet therapy, and the idea here was, okay, maybe dual antiplatelet therapy and full dose anticoagulation is too much from a bleeding risk. Maybe if we decrease the anticoagulant dose, we can strike the sweet spot. And then their third group was anticoagulation with warfarin at full dosing, as well as aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. What they saw in this group looking at the left in terms of clinically significant bleeding is the group that was on warfarin and aspirin had about an absolute 10% increased risk of bleeding compared to the other groups. And so clearly the dual antiplatelet anticoagulation at full dose has this very high bleeding risk with 
during the follow-up period events in up to 25% of the individuals. And this was clinically significant bleeding. At the same time, when they looked at major reverse coronary, uh, cardiovascular events, which is kind of the reason you're trying to prevent these, what you see is that the individuals either on the warfarin and the dual antiplatelet or the full-dose rivaroxaban and the P2Y12 really were indistinguishable with respect to their thrombotic complications. And although they looked similar in the early period of the study, the people who were on slightly less anticoagulation, this group two, but with the dual antiplatelet probably didn't do as well in the long term. And so this uh, literature ha has really led us to think that in people who have this indication for dual antiplatelet plus anticoagulation, that the right approach uh, is to, unless there's kind of very extenuating circumstances, uh, start out with full dose anticoagulation and a P2Y12 inhibitor. And then when their uh, time comes that they can transition off dual antiplatelet, to switch them to uh, anticoagulation and an aspirin. So in this patient, uh, they were anticoagulated for their atrial fibrillation with rivaroxaban, started on single antiplatelet therapy. Uh, with clopidogrel for at least three months. And then, you know, the question becomes ultimately, do you continue on the clopidogrel or do you transition to the aspirin? Um, and so that's how we've been managing these people. I'm curious, you know, Tracy, uh, Jeff, Diane, Sarah, what, what have you seen people doing in trying to balance these risks of bleeding with, with, with risk of thrombosis and the different competing indications? This is the approach that I've seen. Um, and that's pretty, pretty standard for us here. We will keep them on the aspirin and uh, their other antiplatelet agent for a month, and then we drop the aspirin uh, for the next 11 months and resume aspirin and drop the, we use both clopidogrel and ticagalor here um, at 12 months and then just use their oral anticoagulant, whether it's a DOAC or warfarin then at 12 months, they'll just stay on dual therapy then? You know, I would say it's uh, similar similar here. I, I will say, and I don't know if you have this experience as well, at the VA, um, where you have a very, an elderly and frail population, we do have a lot of bleeding complications on dual and triple therapy, which really requires con reconsidering every the whole thing and whether, um, whether it's safe at, at various spots. So we have we have to consider a lot of this on a case-by-case -case basis, but I will say- you know, that, I, Sorry. I completely agree, Tracy. I actually do a lot of my work at the VA in Philadelphia, and you know I worry a lot about the re bleeding complications in our patients. I think it's especially challenging because as you point out, no matter what your best intentions are from the beginning, once you have that bleeding complication, not only do you have the harm of the bleeding complication, but now you're totally reconsidering what your anticoagulant and your antithrombotic therapy is. And I worry that after the bleeding complication, we then get overly concerned and pull them off of everything and now have like, are causing them dual harm because we have them on nothing. And so that's why I tend to take a somewhat cautious approach in the beginning, hoping we can prevent this uh, Averse bleeding event, and then this yo-yoing back and forth between being on too much, being on too little, being on too much, being on too little, uh, which I think never turns out well. Yeah, absolutely. I also think it's important to personalize this a little bit. Um, you know, when we have patients with atrial fibrillation, we, we usually want to go with full dose anticoagulation, and, and that's usually appropriate. But the, the second piece, whether it's a coronary disease element and a coronary stent that was placed, or in this patient situation, a, a bypass graft in the lower extremity that was placed, you know, not all of those patients are going to be exactly the same, and their risk of thrombosis is not always the same. So when I'm seeing these patients in, in clinic or trying to make this decision, I'll go to whoever did that procedure and ask them, 
is this somebody for whom you're really concerned about their thrombosis risk? You know, uh, somebody who had fresh PTFE graft put in, they have a different risk of graft thrombosis than the person who's, whose graft has been there for three, four, five years, you know. And similarly, some people who have a really short, uh, fairly large uh, diameter stent in a, in a proximal coronary artery may be very different from the person who had a very long, small diameter stent placed more distally in, in, a, in a, uh, an area that that may have different concerns. And so I really want to understand what their concerns about thrombosis are and what would be the complications. And that helps me determine how many and how long I'm going to use the anti-platelet uh, uh, agents. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Jeff. I mean, I think that these decisions really have to be made uh, in a coordinated fashion between people managing the different parts of the antithrombotic and the uh, anti-platelet uh, therapy, as well as involving the proceduralist. You know, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of times it's even a gestalt of how things look and how you feel and what, as well as what the downside of the intervention going down is. You know, it's not the same to have a long segment coronary stent go down as it is to have a, you know, balloon angioplasty of your posterior tibial artery go down. And so, you know, I think there are many nuances to making the decisions and you can only benefit the patients when you're involving, I think, the, the, both the people that did the procedures and their other providers. So can I um, ask a question just uh, from the audience regarding Vorapaxer and um, discussing the role of that medication in this patient population? I think that's a great question, and I think for many reasons, I have not seen Vorapax I really catch on in, in the mainstream as a uh, therapy. I mean, I'd be interested to see what Jeff's use of it is, but, you know, I think from a surgeon standpoint, the half-life of Vorapaxar is rather long, and the bleeding combined, the bleeding risk, which is, I think, the main downside to Vorapaxar, plus this fact that it has a really long half-life you know, as someone who then has to start thinking about, okay, all of this medical therapy is not working, now I need to move to intervention, I, I think that certainly gives me some pause. Yeah, I, I think it's the same here in Michigan. We are not seeing hardly any Vorapaxar use. Uh, and I think people were sort of holding their breath, wondering what was going to happen with rivaroxaban. Uh, and so we'll have to see how things shift now, given uh, the FDA's decision today. But uh, we were really seeing people focus on uh, aspirin, a P2Y12 inhibitor, and then either warfarin or one of the direct oral anticoagulants and finding different combinations to work for their patients. Uh, really not a lot of Vorapax are use uh, around here. I have another question. We're talking about minimizing bleeding in these patients who require multiple therapies. Um, do either of you routinely prescribe a PPI in patients who have to be on um, concomitant therapy? Yeah, Sarah, that's a really good question. And um, I probably don't prescribe a PPI often enough. There's actually a nice um, expert consensus document out from the American Heart Association uh, talking about patients who are at high risk for GI bleeding. And those would be patients on dual antiplatelet or combined uh, anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and so, um, I probably am not as good as I should be about prescribing PPIs in patients who are at risk because we know that it can reduce the risk of GI bleed. Now, there are other side effects and, and concerns about PPI, so I don't think we want to use them indiscriminately, but certainly the consequence of having a, a GI bleed when on multiple antithrombotic agents, uh, those are probably some of the patients for whom we should be thinking seriously about using a PPI. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Jeff. I mean, I think this is an area that's very important to think about and is probably unfortunately neglected more than more than it should be by, you know, me me included in that group. I don't know if um, either of you know, in the Redual trial, remember there was uh, a second layer of questions trying to see if the PPI decreased the risk of bleeding in those patients who are under Vigatran plus um, antiplatelet therapy versus triple therapy with warfarin in those two two various doses of dubigatran. I have not seen any of the prelim results of those. That Have either of any of you seen that to know the answer? Because obviously PPI are not without harm. So I think we are really trying to figure out who the best patients are um, to receive that therapy. <laughs> 
No, so I, I have not seen that. And, and I, I may be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure Compass also included a PPI arm to it as well. So I think there are some larger trials that are ongoing looking at this sort of PPI question that are going to help us uh, make some more informed decisions. But um, I think we do know from some retrospective observational studies that in patients taking multiple antithrombotics who are on PPIs, the risk of bleeding does seem to be lower. And so it's at least a therapy that we should be considering uh, for our patients. And, and certainly if we have prospective data telling us that it's beneficial, then we can start thinking about operational effects. You know, should the anticoagulation clinic be involved in identifying some of those patients and asking whether or not they're on a PPI? Again, I think we want to make sure we have the prospective data to really uh, back that up, but it's something to, to think about in the, the next couple of years. I think we got time for one more question, and I guess, Jeff, I'll pose this to you. So let's go back to our patient that had recurrent clot. And she did her three months or six months. What would your recommendations be for someone that's had, say, two recurrent clots or had an unprovoked clot and then clots again? Would you put them on the reduced dose of their DOAC or would you keep them on full dose? And how do we risk stratify that class of patients? Because there's not any uh, studies that have looked at who, who we should put on the 10 milligram RIVA or the 2.5 of rapixaban. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and it's an area where we probably need to be careful about the limitations of uh, the data. And so, um, you know, the use of these low-dose drugs uh, in the extended phase of, of treatment really comes from some fairly selective populations where people were, you know, sort of wondering exactly what to do, not in people for whom we definitely had clear answers about using long-term anticoagulation. Um, that being said, I do tend to offer low-dose rivaroxaban or low-dose apixaban to most of my patients who are going to require long-term anticoagulation. I won't do it in patients who have active cancer. I don't do it in my patients who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I think those are some of my highest risk patients. I certainly don't do it in anyone who's had a clot while being on anticoagulation, but the majority of my patients who are going to require long-term anticoagulation, I will, after six months, say, you know, we could reduce your dose, and it's, and it's probably uh, reasonable for most of them. But I recognize that I don't have as robust data as I would like to be able to say that uh, for everyone. Jeff, what about obesity? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, um, I don't really know how to think about obesity in these patients. You know, we do have the, the guidance from ISTH for treatment in that we should not be using uh, the direct oral anticoagulants in our patients whose BMIs are at the extreme greater than 40 or, or weights are uh, very high. Um, and so it does sort of then raise the question, should we use low dose you know, in the patients who maybe have that BMI between 30 and 40. Um, and, and I just don't know the answer to that. And so um, it's something that I'll usually mention to patients and I'll say, look, we don't know whether this is truly effective in, in all, of the, uh, of all of our patients, but my personal experience has been even in patients whose BMIs are in that 30 to 35 range that they've done pretty well. Again, I think it's an area for which we, we're gonna need some more data to, to help us out. Uh, but it's, it's important that we communicate that. I mean, uh, we, we shouldn't make these decisions for our patients, we should educate and help them make the decisions. Well, thank you. That was a, a great answer and I think an area that there's a lot of confusion and controversy. Thank you all so much. I would like to thank all of our presenters today, Jeff Barnes, Scott Damrauer, Tracy Minicello, Sarah Vasquez, and Diane Wirth. Um, if you missed any of the presentation, this webinar will be, has been recorded and it will be posted on our website early next week. Um, there are more resources on these topics that can be found on a shared page that we have with the American Heart Association, including additional webinars on peripheral artery, artery disease. Uh, you can use the URL seen here to access that or visit the AC Forum homepage to access that as well. Our next webinar will be November 6th 
at noontime, Eastern time. We'll be discussing the paper, The Role of Direct Oral, Can Oral Anticoagulants in the Treatment of Cancer-Associated VTE, Guidance from the SSC and the and of, uh, of the ISTH. Visit our website, acform.org, to register. And we also have our conference coming up in April in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, if you would like to get the early bird rate, register soon. Visit acform2019.org uh, to do so. And I also want to thank our corporate sponsors for supporting this webinar program. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.